Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for coming. Um, we're here to talk about supply chains, which have been completely upended, of course, uh, first by the uh, frosty relationship between the US and China, then the pandemic, now Ukraine. Um, but let's start with the news uh, from yesterday with uh, President Biden G uh, meeting for the first time in, in person uh, since Biden became president. What's your take on the meeting? Well, I'm delighted that they had this meeting and that it took place yesterday because I've, I've only been asked about it since the summer. So I'm glad that it finally took place. Um, look, I think it's a, it's a really good thing. It's really important. Um, I think rightly there's been a lot of attention on um, this particular meeting. Um, it is in person, was in person. Um, and um, I was just uh, looking at the pictures this morning and um, observing uh, that the body language is very powerful from the photos of the two leaders greeting each other, standing together. You can see that there is a familiarity between them, a comfort between them in terms of uh, uh, relating to each other. And I think that that's a really powerful signal to the rest of the world in terms of two leaders who um, are, are capable of managing a tremendously complex relationship. If you look at the U.S.-China relationship, I say this over and over again because um, uh, it's my way of emphasizing the truth of it, which is uh, the U.S.-China relationship is of profound consequence, not just to our two countries and our people, but for the entire world. Um, what you saw yesterday uh, was that the two presidents had a very candid uh, discussion about uh, their respective priorities, um, perspectives across a range of issues. I think that the conversation was over three hours long. President Biden made clear that the United States will continue to vigorously compete with China, including by making investments at home. And you've seen the Inflation Reduction Act, the Chips and Science Act, and by aligning with allies and partners where we have uh, shared interests and challenges with respect to um, the impacts of uh, Chinese policies on our economies and our people. At the same time, President Biden uh, noted that the United States and China must work together on transnational issues like climate change, global food security. You trade, also trade didn't seem to come up. You know, well, it did. Right. It did. I mean, I think that you have to, you have to know the words to look for. So President Biden has also indicated that he raised with President Xi something that um, uh, we have raised consistently, U.S. concerns about the negative economic impacts of China's non-market economic policies on American workers, families, our economy, which are impacts that are not just felt by us, but by others around the world as well. Um, I think that uh, uh, one of the most important takeaways is that um, the two leaders have tasked their senior officials to continue to communicate, and we are looking forward to building on the open and candid conversations that we have been having with our counterparts in Beijing. Are you joining Blinken when he goes to Beijing? <laughs> I've not received my invitation yet. Not yet. <laughs> okay, maybe we should book a ticket. Uh, if you look at tariffs, I mean, you sound pretty optimistic that we're sort of on a path uh, to, to an improved relationship. But do you, do you see any movement on tariffs in the next year or so? I don't know about improved relationship, but I do, I do want to emphasize I'm optimistic about um, the capability to manage an important and complex relationship. With respect to tariffs, again, I think that is part and parcel with the non-economic practices concerns, and we will continue to work on those issues. Why do you keep the tariffs? Why do we keep the tariffs? Yeah. Well, um, <clears throat> I'm thinking about how far back to go in terms of the narrative of tariffs. The tariffs ha uh, have been imposed um, under Section 301 of the Trade uh, Act of 1974. Uh, that is a trade enforcement statute those tariffs are intended to be a uh, rebalancing, playing field leveling measure. Uh, if you recall, the tariffs that were imposed were uh, uh, at the conclusion of a lengthy investigation into uh, Chinese intellectual property rights abuses and forced tech transfer practices. 
challenges that not just the American economy and our stakeholders have experienced in doing business with China, engaging with the Chinese economy, but frankly, I think um, uh, everyone understands and has experienced to be a, a considerable challenge. So those tariffs remain in place because the underlying issues are still there. And uh, we have been engaging with China on the tariffs, on the underlying issues, on the non-market economic practices and their impacts. We've not got resolution yet. We will continue to press. Mm. I mean, knowing what you know now, do you think it was a mistake that uh, China was allowed to enter the WTO? Um, I've had many versions of this conversation, um, including with members of Congress who were in Congress. Um, who uh, took a very difficult vote, either ones who voted for or against permanent, uh, permanent normal uh, trading relations with China. Um, look, uh, what's happened in the past has happened. I would say that uh, whether you um, look back and think that um, uh, it was naive um, or hopeful, um, I think that uh, it's neither here nor there. Um, let me just say this, and I think um, this relates to so many aspects of the U.S.-China relationship, and in particular, uh, the economic relationship, which is, which is my area, which is that um, <clears throat> I think we should remember that uh, nothing is predestined. And so in terms of how uh, we have seen the trajectory of China's participation at the WTO and where we are today in the relationship between China and the United States, China and the rest of the world, uh, I don't think that there's any reason why this necessarily had to be the result. Where we are today is the result of many decisions that were taken and not taken by China and by others, including the United States. I think the key question is where do we go from here and again, I want to remind everyone, <clears throat> nothing is predestined. Where we go from here is going to also be the outcome of decisions that we take on both sides and around the world. Let me pivot. The other big thing that happened was midterms in the, in the past week. Um, has anything changed on your to-do list? Uh, look, uh, President Biden instructed me to deliver on what he's called a worker-centered trade policy. For us, that means um, placing the interests of our people, thinking of our people as workers, as productive uh, parts of our economy, as human beings, uh, into the trade equation. Um, <clears throat> this is fundamentally an approach that is built for durability and that is built on um, a vision for uh, bipartisan, broad, robust support. So, with respect to the midterms, um, I think that you've heard President Biden say the administration is here and ready to play. I would say that with, re with respect to trade policy, we have been pursuing from day one a trade policy that is intended to be broadly and bipartisan supported, and that will continue. You're proud of all the investments that the U.S. companies are making to, to uh, friendshore or, or reshore. At the same time, building basically parallel supply chains is very expensive. I mean, can the economy and the world economy, can they afford all these costs of building parallel supply chains? Um, let me put it this way, and I think for the Bloomberg crowd of um, savvy business people, um, <clears throat> of which I am not necessarily one, I'm, I'm, just, a, I'm just a trade person. Um, but um, I like to think of it or analogize uh, the vision for a more resilient global economy, one that um, um, uh, takes into account uh, the need for a plan B, a plan C, a plan D, because we've seen that we can't just rely, we can no longer uh, take for granted that uh, the world economy will just work like clockwork. <clears throat> That um, that vision for world economy, um, I think, involves a little bit of uh, adopting this notion about um, the virtues and benefits of insurance. It is not efficient to be paying for insurance every single day, but the concept behind insurance is that um, it will be there for you uh, the day that there is an emergency or a ca catastrophe or some kind of a crisis where you are going to need that cushion and that resilience. And I think of it very much the same way. Um, let's talk about the Indo-Pacific uh, economic framework, uh, one of your priorities, certainly in this region. How's that going? 
it's going great. Um, and uh, you know, um, I'm delighted that you're asking me that question while I'm back in Singapore. Uh, because certainly in terms of um, uh, launching the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, um, uh, which the president did uh, with his counterparts back in May, to the um, first in-person ministerial that we hosted in Los Angeles in September, uh, we are now looking at the first engagement of our senior officials um, to get together for um, the first negotiating round in Australia in a couple of weeks at the beginning of December, uh, that um, all of this momentum that we've generated um, is certainly um, uh, thanks to um, a tremendously strong partnership that we have had in this region, um, in particular from Singapore. So uh, looking uh, at uh, going into 2023, uh, we are uh, extremely excited. Um, there is uh, a framework that we've created for uh, innovation to create a 21st century framework for 21st century challenges that include uh, very disrupted supply chains and a global economy that is really searching for uh, the opportunity to rebuild confidence, uh, to demonstrate uh, sustainability, resilience, and inclusion. Do you have any specific proposals that you'll bring to the table when you meet? Yes, so um, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework is uh, not a traditional free trade agreement uh, by design. Uh, trade is one component, but not the only component. So this is economic engagement that includes trade and that goes beyond trade. So we have four pillars. First pillar, uh, trade, uh, led by USTR. Second pillar on supply chains. Third pillar on uh, infrastructure and decarbonization. Fourth pillar on tax and anti-corruption. So um, within the trade pillar, I can go into the components. I think we've got um, somewhere around seven to 10 different components. Some of them are quite traditional um, uh, trade issues. And again, everything is scoped to address resilience, sustainability, and inclusion. So um, uh, trade facilitation, which is about uh, facilitating the movement of goods across borders. Uh, something that we called good regulatory practices. And as you can see, uh, in, in terms of naming trade topics, uh, we don't win any awards for uh, marketing or jazziness, but uh, tremendously important in terms of regulatory practices, transparency, uh, notice and comment processes, uh, but also uh, all important um, uh, uh, disciplines around um, uh, labor and worker protections, uh, environment sustainability, and uh, the digital economy, um, which is a uh, novel and emerging area um, that, frankly, uh, all of the counterparts I talk to are focused on um, the opportunity that we have right now uh, to be shaping uh, cooperation mechanisms and rules. Is there a time frame to reach an agreement? Yes. Um, now. <laughs> I think this is, this is meant to be an economic framework um, to address the challenges that we are facing now. And so part of the design of this not being a traditional free trade agreement negotiation, um, those types of negotiations typically go on for several years. By the time you finish them, get them across the finish line, implement them, um, you've discovered that they are designed for um, an economy that uh, has already been um, progressed beyond. Uh, so, um, key to our vision across the four pillars uh, is to be able to deliver timely results, and uh, that is what 2023 will be all about. Right. So, now means in the next two years? Or? Sure. Uh, but, you know, again, uh, emerging challenges, um, the state of the global economy, and I think that um, folks in the audience will know this uh, even more personally than, uh, than I will. Um, <clears throat> this is a global economy that is going through a lot of changes. And so um, the other uh, design aspect of the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework is that it will allow for the countries participating to continue to uh, evolve our engagement as um, the economy around us changes. We've talked a lot about China and, and this region. What about Europe and Latin America? Are they on the back burner in your policy? Or? All important, and um, I feel like uh, you've left out Africa, so we should talk about all of it. That's yes. Uh, no, I think tremendously, tremendously important. Uh, in some ways, um, uh, the world is very, very large, um, and I'm reminded of that when I spend um, 16 hours flying. <laughs> <laughs> maybe um, um, almost a full day flying from Washington all the way to Singapore. Uh, in other respects, though, um, the world uh, can feel quite small in terms of the connectivity. So from our perspective, you know, to President Biden's point, 
uh, aligning with our allies and partners, um, uh, the countries and economies with whom we have shared interests, shared values, with whom we have a shared vision around um, the kind of global economy that we want to build and we want our uh, people to have the opportunity to thrive in, um, this is our opportunity to be engaging and to be building out that vision. So uh, yes, across the board, whether it's Europe and the Trade and Technology Council, um, the global steel arrangement that we're negotiating, um, <coughs> um, uh, with respect to Africa, uh, we've got a strategic trade and investment partnership with Kenya. Uh, we have been engaged with the uh, AFCFTA and uh, Latin America. We just had the Summit of the Americas in June. Um, and uh, this is an area where we have the most existing trade agreements um, that the United States has with any region is with Latin America. So um, uh, I, I guess if I boil this all down, uh, yes. Um, as uh, President Biden has said, um, he's instructed us to um, exercise a relentless diplomacy, and that is very much a part of what we are doing in trade. Um, we're almost out of time, but uh, trade is slowing, according to the WTO. Um, what sorts of economic clouds are you most concerned about in the next 12 months? Oh, well, um, I think that uh, for the next 12 months, let me just say this, I think this has been a tremendously challenging time. Um, from, the, uh, from the individual level of coming through almost three years of COVID, the impacts on us as um, uh, in our work, uh, in our in our families, in our personal lives, uh, has been profound, um, and and across the board, collectively, something that we've gone through. In terms of those impacts on the global economy, in terms of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, um, the pressures on world energy markets, and also on uh, food trade. Um, uh, I, I think that these um, complexities are multi-layered right now. So uh, what am I most concerned about over the course of the next year? I guess what I would say is this. Instead of focusing on where the clouds are, uh, in order to get through jobs uh, uh, like these, um, you have to be also relentlessly optimistic. So over the course of the next year, uh, I am so looking forward to engaging with my counterparts, uh, whether they are in uh, Brussels or Tokyo, Singapore, um, Brasilia, uh, Mexico City, or Beijing, um, because it is only by engaging each other um, that we can build towards uh, that resilience and that revived confidence uh, in uh, global economic prosperity that uh, I think we're all so looking forward to. On that hopeful note, thank you very much. Thank you.